Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Nikita. I'm the co-founder and CEO of SSCRD, an organization which is working towards promoting space education and STEM and outreach and and everything about space. So. One of the program that we do is uh, SSCRD Space Talks. And for this particular Space Talk, we have been collaborated with uh, IAU. And I, I hope all of you know about IAU. It's, it's one of the uh, amazing or renowned organization which brings in a lot of astronomers. At the same time, it brings in a lot of students together and uh, let everyone interact and learn. And uh, as part of one of their initiative called as meet an IAU astronomer we have dr juan hernandez over here today who's going to talk about black holes and i know most of us here when we talk about astronomy or astrophysics the only thing which which kind of creates the curious among all of us is black hole like all of these four years from the time i've been teaching students Everywhere I go, the only question I get for sure is tell me more about black hole, right? So this is something like very curious topic and amazing. Uh, in fact, one of the important topic, the reason being, if you all know this year's Nobel Prize for Physics 2020 went for astrophysics. I mean, there are so many signs like, you know, different uh, sectors in physics and astrophysics bagged it for this year and and it's so important if you look at it again for what under astrophysics is again a black hole so i think uh, it's going to be amazing time for all of us to know more about black holes from dr juan as part of meet an iu astronomer as well as sscid space talk with no delay i would like to introduce um today's speaker who is uh, the researcher fellow at the University of uh, St. Andrews and then also an astronomer at IAU. He is a Mexican engineer and uh, also an astronomer who is currently working um, as a research fellow, as I said. And he mainly works with uh, Kate Horn on multi-wavelength observations of uh, accrediting compact objects and active galactic nuclei, AGM, um, focusing on X-rays ultraviolet, optical, and infrared. He uh, obtained his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at UN, UNAM with a particular focus in astronomical instrumentation. He pursued MSc in astronomy at the Institute of Astronomy at UNAM again. And then um, he later moved to UK where he received his PhD um, at the University of Southampton. It's, he's done a lot of work, uh, he's, gone, he's gone to many places and moreover, he's so much interested in outreach and public engagement activities. I think this is what kind of um, creates interest in him to speak to all of us today. So I welcome you, uh, Dr. Juan, for this um, space talk and we're so excited to hear from you and I would request you to take over and the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Nikita, for that uh, very nice introduction, and welcome everyone. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have a really nice uh, chat about black holes, about what they are, some recent, uh, uh, some recent advancements on it, and also I'd like to talk to you about what I, what I actually do about black holes. Uh, hopefully, that will wrap it up in a nice uh, talk, and then hopefully we'll have enough question, uh, time for questions at the end. So save those uh, for last. Uh, so I will start sharing my screen and just hopefully you will, you can all see it. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so yeah, so my name is Juan Hernandez. Uh, uh, and today I'll be talking to you about black holes uh, and more specifically about supermassive black holes. Uh, and and a very very cool technique that has allowed us to uh, to observe the the inner regions very close to the to the black hole itself. Um, so I guess the first question that we should probably start is like, what is 
what is an, an, a black hole? Uh, and a black hole is, uh, is really a place in space time where material is incredibly dense and, uh, and the gravity that that mass generates in that very small region of space, uh, curves the space time itself and uh, the gravity is just so big that not even light can escape, right? So everything that it, uh, essentially gets into that sphere of influence of, of this material uh, get, it belongs to this black hole. And then material that can either plunge into the black hole just gets trapped in there as well as any light that goes in as well. And this is a very... Uh, uh, this is a very nice prediction of the best theory that we have of gravity, of Einstein's general relativity. And these black holes, these apparently uh, almost impossible things that could occur in nature, just come out, out of, the, of, the, of the equations of the math itself. Um, and they were long predicted uh, before we actually started to observe them. So even at first, people didn't really believe that these black holes ever existed, that they were just some mere... Um, uh, casualties of the theory, right? Nobody really thought they were actually real. Uh, but nowadays, we do have some evidence about it. And there's a lot of objects out there, and there's a lot of evidence in many different ways. Um, and we know that there are at least two types of black holes, very roughly general. Some st what we call stellar mass black holes, which are originated uh, in the end life of uh, very big massive stars. When they rain, run out of fuel in their center, these, these stars, these very big massive stars, explode in this uh, tremendous uh, supernovae that we call them. And the core, the remnant of the star, collapses on itself because they, it doesn't have enough energy to produce to prevent this gravitational collapse. And, and that core turns into a black hole. And usually these are what we call like relatively small black holes around 10 to 100 solar masses. And then we have this very other big category called uh, about the supermassive black holes. So these are tens of thousands, millions, and even billions of solar mass uh, uh, type black holes, which are just humongous. And usually you reside at the core and at the center of almost every or even every single large galaxy out there in the, in the universe. Um, so, and in, during the talk, I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about a little bit about stellar mass black holes and then focus on the last part on the supermassive black holes. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about, well, this is very neat, right? So we know that these black holes should exist, at least from theory, but what evidence do we have of their existence? We don't have a black hole here on Earth. We don't have one in our solar system. Uh, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult to make them, right? So how do we actually know they exist? And by no means this is a complete list. There's a lot, there's a big frame of evidence uh, uh, built in in the last 50, 60 years uh, that gave us, the, uh, gave us proof that these things are actually real. They're a part of nature, consequences of uh, gravity. And probably the big uh, candidate for a stellar mass black hole, it was this uh, object uh, called Cygnus X1. So it was a, it was a, it was a source, a very bright X-ray source in the sky discovered by a balloon experiment in the, in the, in the 60s or 70s. And what is very interesting about this X-ray source, that it was varying super fast. And this uh, sort of what it looks like there uh, in, in this very neat animation. And that flashing of X-rays um, uh, hinted to the astronomers that, uh, that whatever was making this X-ray source should be, should be incredibly small. Uh, and because these are X-rays, so these are very energetic particles, usually stars don't produce this amount of X-rays. So you need to have something really, uh, really massive, which has a lot of energy and has a lot of gravitational potential in order to generate that much X-rays. And further evidence uh, in the 80s and 90s um, revealed that, uh, because it turns out that this black hole was not by itself. So it was actually orbiting another star. So you had the black hole orbiting another big star. And because black holes, we cannot see them, uh, but we could see that, that, that star, the companion star right by its side. So we could measure how this star moved around something that was invisible. Um, and, that is the, and that is like the graph that you see in the, in the bottom right. So that is tracking the movement, the orbit of this star. 
And just by using this star, it turns out that in order for that star to move that fast, it required a very big, an invisible and heavy object of around 14 solar masses. So this, uh, with a lot of other evidence, just pointed out that whatever was in there uh, should be something as, uh, should be a, a black hole. And a lot of things happen in between, uh, but probably what you, what everybody has a lot more in, in your mind is that in the last five years, a lot of things have occurred uh, in this, in this field. And in particular, it was the, the final culmination of uh, almost a hundred year length, uh, length experiment building up from all the way from the start of, uh, uh, when Einstein produced his general relativity theories, some of these, uh, experiments were proposed not long after. And it was about um, discovering that when two heavy masses orbit around each other, they should be emitting what are called gravitational waves. They should emit energy as they move around each other. Uh, and this the release of energy of two massive objects orbiting uh, should make these systems go, uh, come smaller and smaller and smaller. So an obvious conclusion would be that when these two things get smaller and smaller, eventually they will collapse and merge with each other. And that is exactly what these, uh, the team of the LIGO interferometer and Virgo, uh, they've been trying to do for a long time. And on the 14th of September of 2015, uh, the first extraterrestrial signal of a gravitational wave was directly, was directly, was directly measured. Uh, and it turns out that when you try to infer what, what would be the origin of this, of this, uh, of this signal, it turns out that it would be a, it, it would, it can be reproduced by a 30 solar mass black hole and another 35 solar mass black hole orbiting into their collapse and death and the, and the merge. And this would produce a 62 solar mass, uh, and at the end of this collision, would produce a 62 solar mass uh, black hole. So this is this is fantastic, right? But maybe the keen observer in in the audience might look at that at that little equation and would see that well, 30 plus 35 doesn't add up to 62, and you would be correct. Uh, the thing is that that energy release in that merge, that's where that the three solar mass deficit comes from. So in fact, the collision of these two black holes emitted, the converted three solar masses of energy. So three times our sun just radiated away into gravitational waves, which is quite impressive. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot more of these black holes uh, orbiting, uh, uh, have been discovered through the past uh, five years. So we are definitely in a new era or of... Uh, in a new era to understand black holes and these black hole mergers. And it's so this, so now, nowadays we have three of these interferometers online, but more are being planning and, and especially one in, in India, which I think will begin construction or has been, uh, is now in construction or be very, very soon. So this is a very, a very good, nice piece of evidence worth of the 2017 Nobel prize. And as already uh, said before, uh, this year was there was another Nobel Prize uh, uh, for the study of black holes. And, and in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, the observational part of this, uh, um, of this prize. The other half was awarded to Roger Penrose for his theoretical work on, the, on, on black holes. But on the observational side, how would we actually do this? So it turns out that two teams, two independent teams, uh, one using the uh, telescopes in South America, in Chile, uh, 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 which was led by Reinhard Gensel, um, they, uh, and, the, and another one using telescopes in Hawaii, led by Andrea Guess, they were both looking at the center of our galaxy, and they were tracking using very novel instruments the movement of the stars around the, around the, central, around the central source of the, of the black hole. Uh, well, so the, what they were tracking is all the individual stars, and it turns out that uh, you can figure out by just mapping the orbits what kind of object should these things and how massive an object should be should be in in the middle of this for these stars to move the way they do. And in order to reproduce the orbits of all these stars, you would need a four million uh, solar mass object. Uh, 
that is not visible and it's super compact, right? So in fact, in fact, even the Nobel Prize uh, legend here says is they don't actually say black hole, right? They just discovered that there should be a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. Because that's technically the only, the only thing that they have actually done, right? There must be something very compact that is not emitting a lot of light, uh, that it's at the center uh, influencing all the movements of all the stars. But now we know building upon a lot of other discoveries around this, supermass this, uh, around this region is that the only thing that we know of that can have all these characteristics, it's a black hole. So this is very, this is incredibly interesting, right? Because if there is, if there is one black hole in our, in our galaxy, why wouldn't there be in all the other galaxies out there, right? And this 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 black hole is not uh it's big right it's millions of times bigger than anything that we have here uh just uh in a galaxy and can be produced by just by stars so one question that uh, astronomers have been trying to find out is how do you grow these black holes how do you make a, a black hole this massive um and one of the interesting things about this is that, well, we see that, uh, so this is an image of the extreme deep field. So it's an image taken in a very dark patch of sky with a Hubble Space Telescope. And everything that you see here is uh, it's a galaxy. And if we can think that there, if there is a black hole in our, in our galaxy, it would be, it would be a, very, uh, a very interesting reasoning that there must be a, a supermassive black hole in every single one of these, of these galaxies that you see here. So, and if we can look at these galaxies throughout cosmic time, back to the start of, of the universe, then, uh, then black holes should, should grow and evolve with the universe in conjunction, right? So understanding how the universe works should also uh, we should also understand how these black holes uh, evolve throughout time and we sort of had an idea of of the existence of these black holes by looking at sort of nearby galaxies so by around the 1960s um, uh, people were discovering that at the center of these galaxies there were there were uh, there were point sources, very very powerful and bright things coming from uh, some some of these galaxies, and nothing that they knew at the time could produce that uh, that amount of uh, of light. Some of that light would be equivalent to a lot of the amount of energy released by a lot of part of the galaxy. So these things should be incredibly powerful. And around the mid sixties, people were coming to the idea that. Maybe it was uh, that the, one of the most plausible things to explain this would be to have material coming in into the black hole. So material plunging in and being eaten by the black hole could be enough to produce this amount of light. Um, and this is very interesting, right? Because if black holes start, uh, start eating material that are very close to them and then can shine away a lot of light, they can also spew out particles far away from the black hole. So they can influence the growth of the galaxy itself. And this is what new simulations had been showing, that, uh, that the black holes at the center of galaxies evolve with the galaxies themselves and influence how they feed, how they, how they make stars, and how they, uh, how they blow out material in and out of the galaxy. So there's an intricate relationship uh, between, between the two. Um, and one of the ways that we can, that people have been trying to understand this inner part of the, of the black hole and how this black hole interacts with its surrounding is by studying these, uh, active galactic nuclei. And one of the best examples and more recent example is the one from AIM-87. It's a very, very massive galaxy, very close by. Um, so this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see that the galaxy in the center has a tiny little filament in blue. So that's material that it's coming from a very tiny, from the very black center of the black hole. So it's a jet of very fast particles. And you can see that this jet is comparable to the size of the galaxy. So you can see how this tiny little black hole in the scale of a galaxy can influence things outside of it. Um, and we think that, that uh, so using simulations, we think we understand sort of how this works. So you have material coming in from the sides to the black hole, and part of that material 
plunges into the black hole and some of it gets out of it. So in this, in this jets. So people have been trying to see, well, can we observe material that is coming out from this black hole as well? And this is what it was done uh, just, uh, just last year and a couple of, couple of years ago. Uh, so there was, a, so the Event Horizon Telescope was a telescope uh, used by uh, combining different radio telescopes across the world and link them together in order to use it as one single big telescope. And by pointing it to this galaxy, to the, M8, to the center of M87, um, they would expect that the material going around the black hole will, uh, would produce emission observed by these radio telescopes. So they did this, they, they tried this experiment, and it turns out that when they did that, they, they observe this. So this is the material coming from very clear, from the ring of material coming from the black, uh, and the outskirts of the black hole. And this is a very nice, uh, well, the image is also consistent with the predictions of general relativity, right? So the shadow in the inner part is consistent with what we expect, uh, from, from general relativity. So therefore it's another one of these clues that the, that the black holes that we see in the math they actually have a counterpart in, on nature. So uh, very robust evidence. And uh, yeah, so uh, up on the top right, that's the link. So it's telescopes all the way from Chile, Hawaii, Mexico, and Greenland, right? So it covers the whole, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the whole globe. Unfortunately, and one of the things that I'm very interested in is that people have been studying very close to the black hole and just a little part of this jet. But I'm very interested in how the material flows and jumps into the into the black hole uh, and unfortunately we don't have any telescope or any in instrument out there that can allow us to directly image this flow of material what we call this accretion disk of material close to the black hole so how can we but i'm very interested and this is where my work actually comes into play uh, because there are ways of uh, indirectly observe this um, so this would be the, just to, the, the last part of my, of my talk is just to try to tell you a little bit of how these black, supermassive black holes feed and a technique called echo, echo mapping uh, and, and how we do it. So echo mapping works a lot like sonars, right? We cannot really go and map the, the whole surface of the bottom of the ocean in our, in our own planet. But we can go and mapping using sound waves. So we, we, can, we can be on a, on a boat and we can be using sound waves traveling down to the bottom of the sea and then bouncing back. And then depending on how long it takes for that sound wave, sound wave to travel and then get back, uh, it tells us a little bit about the distance between the boat and the bottom of the sea. And that's how we can make all these fantastic maps. And this is the same way how we do it, uh, how we map the surface of other planets, of Venus and Mars. Uh, so it's a very well-known thing, right? So in order to map something that you can't really access it, you, re you need a signal with a known speed, right? So the distance would just be the speed times the time it takes between uh, where it was sent and where it, it sent back, right? So how can we apply this to supermassive black holes? Well, we have sort of like a sonar system happening in the black holes because of these. So here you have now, so imagine that you have the black hole and then you have a whole disk of material just orbiting and swirling around it. Um, and imagine that there is, uh, so you have see there the black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope, but imagine that you have like a bulb of light uh, that it's just very close to the black hole. So that bulb of, of black hole will emit a lot of light and some of it will come directly to us. So you will see the, the so it, uh, our point of view would be that little triangle uh, at, at the far right. So some of that light would come directly to us, but some of that light would actually bounce on this accretion disk around the supermassive black hole. So if we could measure that time delay between when we get that first image and the bouncing of that light from the accretion disk, it can tell us about the distances of how big this disk uh, is. And in fact, knowing a little bit about how this accretion disk uh, works, we can actually also tell how fast, so how much material is plunging into the black hole. So it's really cool, right? So if we can, get, if we can actually measure these echoes, we can see, we can actually see how, how fast uh, the black hole is fitting.
And this is just a little bit of a schematic, right? Uh, so in the center, you have the black hole. And what we actually see is that the, that the material gets hotter as it gets close to the black hole. So very close to the black hole, you would expect to see a lot of uh, high energy light, like X-rays and uh, like, 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 like X-rays. As you go uh, further away, you start observing ultraviolet. As you go a little bit further away, you start to see optical like light we can see. And further and further away from the disk, you start to see near for it, right? So the further you are away from the disk, the, the light is going to be uh, has going to be lower energy. So would you expect that these echoes would be longer at longer wavelengths, at longer at, at lower energy, and the delays and the echoes would be smaller at, uh, at, for example, at higher energies like ultraviolet. So we actually went and do and test this, and we use this by using uh, two instruments in particular. So this one is Las Cumbres Observatory. So it's a robotic network of, of telescopes. So it's, it's very small one meter telescopes that are just positioned all around the world. But it, what it allows us to, to, to do is that it's always night in one of these sites. So we can monitor one of these supermassive black holes almost three times per day. So for example, one of them, the one that I'm going to show uh, in, in just a bit, it's in the southern part of the, uh, uh, you can only see it from the southern part of the, of the planet. So every time it goes on top of Chile, you take an image. Every time it goes over Australia, you take an image and South Africa. And you do this every single day, every single day. Um, and because we cannot observe X-rays or ultraviolet from the Earth, we use the X-ray, uh, the NASA's X-ray Swift telescope, uh, which allows us to do that. So every time, so we had this telescope pointing at this same supermassive black hole once per day. Um, and we did this in a very, like, very cool, uh, very cool uh, galaxy. It's called Feral Nine, um, and we think that this is a, that it has a supermassive black hole of around 260 million solar masses. Um, so we did this, and we have done this already for three years. And what you're actually going to see in this little animation, it's the data. Uh, so this is all the from the ultraviolet in the top going through the optical all the way to the near infrared. So this is actual data coming from the supermassive black hole, and you can see that it's just wiggling all around, right? So you can see wiggles coming in and about about them, and this is just material being uh, shuffling in into, into into the black hole. But maybe the keen observer in the audience can see that maybe there's some delay, right? We want to see echoes. So we want to see echoes going first in the upper part, in the ultraviolet, and then echoes later in the other part. So maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but I would like to focus around this part, right? So look at, look at the, in the ultraviolet, uh, in this peak around the ultraviolet, and then go all the way down and see how that little peak starts moving to the right. And once you get to the very end of the near infrared, that peak has moved. I'll just switch between these two. So that means that we're actually seeing an echo moving, moving around. And that echo is around eight days. So that means that the region of this disk is around eight light days away from where the other part of the near infrared is happening. So this tells us the size of the disk uh, surrounding the supermassive black hole, which is, which is incredibly, it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing, right? You cannot see it, and yet you can still measure these incredibly uh, big distances. And so you can do this for all the lights and see the relative shift for all of them, so you can create how big the disk is getting. And this is just a summary graph where you can see all the single, all the different parts of the disk and how they are increasing in time. So at zero would be the, where, the, where, the, where the black hole, where the supermassive black hole is and how the, how the echo spreads as you go out farther away into the accretion disk. And this is just like a summary, right? And just to put it into context of how, this, how big this is. Um, so uh, you, this is the same accretion disk. And remember that the last, so all the way when we see the infrared, it's around light, eight light days, right? So it takes light to travel eight days from the center of supermassive black hole to that part of the disk. In contrast, the farthest thing that uh, humans have ever put in space is the Voyager 1, which is only 20 light hours away. It's not even one light day away from, uh, from Earth. Pluto is just five light hours away, and the Earth is only eight light minutes. 
So you can now put into perspective how big this disk is. This disk is bigger than the whole solar system, uh, just feeding, and all of that is feeding into this solar mass black hole. And from the same analysis, we can actually say that about ten, a tenth of the of our uh, of the mass of our sun gets eaten by the black hole every single year. So in around a decade, the whole mass of our sun would just be eaten by the black hole, which is a tremendous amount of material just trying to plunge in. So, so with that, I think I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish and probably leave a little bit of space for for questions. Uh, but hopefully I can try to convince you that studying these black holes are, are they're just super intriguing. And uh, we're really trying to understand how they, how these black, supermassive black holes grow throughout cosmic times, all the way from the first galaxies to what we see now, to our own supermassive black hole in the Milky Way. Um, and I'll show you that this technique of echo mapping can be done using this incredibly like robotic network of telescopes and X-ray satellites. And it's giving us uh, a way of understanding how these black holes feed. Uh, feed. And now I, I'm, so I'm the principal investigator of a new key project with this network of telescopes. Uh, we will be doing these kind of same experiments for another eight supermassive black holes uh, uh, for uh, in another for, for three years for, uh, for the next three years. So we're monitoring them almost every day. Um, and there's a little bit of a link there to the to the key projects from these Las Cumbres where you can find a little bit more information about this project. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'll just uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, uh, Juan. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, explanation about black holes and what you've been working and your journey. It was, it was amazing. So, I, I mean, we have another 20 minutes and uh, I would request all the audience over here to ask your questions. What you need to do is you have uh, the questions option over there to your right hand side. Um, what you need to do is just go there and put your questions and I'll pick up from there and I'll post it to Dr. Juan and he will try to answer them. Uh, there is also an option to give a like to the question. So the most number of like question could be picked from here. And to those everyone who's watching on YouTube, do comment your questions there. We're gonna pick it from there as well. So we have the first question here by Soumya. Can you explain the reasons behind the synchrotron radiation that sometimes comes off accretion disks? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit more of a technical question, uh, but I'll try to understand, right? So uh, try to explain it. So secret radiation is uh, is just light emitted by particles that are moving around uh, magnetic fields. So you, whenever you have a magnetic field, if you have, for example, electrons just running around, uh, that will emit light. So a lot of the material that is going in into the black hole has a lot of free electrons and there's a lot of magnetic fields that are surrounding the disk and around the black hole. So it's, it's actually a very natural consequence that a lot of those electrons are gonna get trapped in this, in this spiral mayhem around the black hole. And that, mat and, and that, and, and that material is going to produce this synchrotron emission. And that's a lot of the emission that we're actually seeing in the Event Horizon Telescope. So a lot of that, uh, that ring of material is coming from this synchrotron emission, just from material that it's plunging or going away from the, from the black hole. But you require those two things, right? You require magnetic fields and you require uh, free material like electrons. Thank you so much, uh, Juan. And I hope, Samia, you got your answer. We have another question from Merin John. Uh, where can I get proper data sets for black hole image processing? Um, I mean, depends what kind of black hole uh, data you want, uh, right? Uh, there's a lot, right? So, for example, for the gravitational wave data, all of that data is public. So you can go to the LIGO and Virgo website and there's actually, you can download the data and you can download the analysis, the complete analysis and run it through your computer. So you can see exactly what the astronomers are using in order to go from the data to get the mass of the black holes that, that join, that, that come together. Uh, 
for the so a lot of the images for example for the for the supermassive black hole i think most of them should be public by now so you can go to the websites of all these observatories and download the data and then just look at the data yourself uh, of course it will take a little bit of processing to do all of that but that is something that you can do um, and, I, and again there's a lot of most of the data in astronomy eventually becomes public so there's only um, a period that we call proprietary data uh, where the astronomers essentially you pro because how it works is that you propose to do these experiments you don't go just go there and just look blindly sometimes you do but it's not necessarily uh, but you, once you go there uh, you propose this experiment, so it's just fair that you have at least a chance to. Okay. Um, yeah. We see that the speaker. Yeah, we have a speaker. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, yes. So. Ah, where was I? <laughs> Um, yeah, so 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 all the image, all the all the data is public, right? So it, astronomers would like to have a a first hand at using all these data. So uh, usually it's just like a year, maybe two years at most. But after that, most of the data is public. So whatever you want to look for black holes, the data is out there. Awesome! Thank you so much, Juan. And then there are uh, quite a lot of questions right here as well as on YouTube. It's about Hawking radiation, like they want to know what is it and why does it occur? If you could share some information about it. Yeah, so Hawking radiation is a um, is is a is a is a kind of light that is expected to be emitted at the boundaries at the event horizon of the black hole. So it's it's a, it's one of the consequences of merging general relativity and quantum mechanics. So one of the one of the most common ways to explain it is that the that's that there is in quantum mechanics there's a phenomenon where uh, particles get produced simul uh, produced uh, from from fluctuations in the quantum background. So light can be produced and then it and then it cancels back again. But at the event horizon. Remember that light cannot escape. So if there's a particle or a like particle of light that gets generated at that event horizon, one can go in and one can go out. So then, so then, so then, when that goes out, then then that material is actually getting out of the of the black hole. So that is a way of actually making the black holes evaporate over time. But that amount of light and energy that gets released at this boundary, it's it's super tiny. Like there is no way that we can observe it with current instrumentation or technology. Uh, and it's expected that, I mean, at the moment, remember that if this black, hole, this black hole that I showed, it's like a 10th of our sun is just plunging in every year. So a lot more things is coming in than energy radiated going out. But it is expected that when every, when all the black holes stop accreting and everything, these black holes will start to evaporate by leaking radiation a little bit at a time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and then there are a few more questions uh, which I would like to kind of add together. Like, is there something inside the black hole? I think you did answer, but probably a few of them just join now. Um, if you could answer what's inside the black hole or the other side of the black hole, if there is any other side. At the same time, is there any relation of this question with the white hole? or some kind of theories at the same time what would happen if we enter into the black hole is it connected to somewhere to singularity and like all these are connected questions if you could answer them that would be great too yes uh so so we think that at the at the center of this black hole to so remember this black hole is just an accumulation of matter in a very tiny small of space uh, of, of space so from the math, we would expect that all of this material just keeps going down into an infinite point. And that's what, from the mathematics, we think that's what it's called a singularity, right? So that's that point, that point in space inside a black hole where density goes to infinity. Now, how does that actually work? We actually don't know. Uh, so we, and we really, we really don't know what happens once you are inside of it. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of the, 
math and the theories just break down at the last part of the, of, of, of the black hole. Uh, maybe when we, when we actually find a way of merging quantum mechanics and the uh, theory of quantum mechanics and the theory of, of, of gravity, there might be a way of telling what is actually happening very close to the singularity. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, from the math side, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no answer. From the observational side, it's even harder. We can only see things that are going and spiraling around the black hole and things that are trying to get out of it. Uh, but once this matter goes inside the black hole, we lose, we lose a lot of uh, what will happen to that in there. So who knows? Uh, so regarding uh, black uh, white holes, so that would be the equivalent of instead of everything sucking in, everything just being spewed out like a lot the other side of a black hole. Which again, I think there might be some theoretical work that might produce them, but we haven't found anything. Uh, observationally, we don't see anything like that. And uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm also not an entire expert on the theory. So uh, I think that's where I would leave my answer before digging deeper into a black hole myself. Absolutely, not a problem, uh, Juan. Thank you so much. And then there's uh, one of the important questions which I which I personally feel uh, from Rohan Matthew. He says, uh, or he's asking, considering the current research uh, that's happening, uh, what is your predictions about the next major breakthrough in this field? And how long do you think it will take for such a breakthrough to happen? Um, at the same time, I would also request you to, uh, you know, share a few words about this year's Nobel Prize winners and their discoveries and the, their work, in fact. Right. So I think I'll probably start with this year's uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, it's, I mean, it, it looks easy to get what they have done, right? But it requires not only the, like the group to propose this experiment, but it requires a lot of engineers, staff, uh, to make just the telescopes, the observatories working, and all of this. This, <coughs> sorry, these, uh, these observations that uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize were taken over decades, right? So it's, it's hard to keep a program going through decades, students coming in, postdoctoral uh, researchers coming in and go, taking the images, keep processing them, keep upgrading everything. Uh, so it just, it, it, just by showing those images, like those little videos, a lot of it goes into that little 10, 20 second video that, that allows you to infer such a fantastic thing, right? And, uh, and on the other side, you have Roger Penrose, where his work in conjunction with, with Stephen Hawking gave a lot of the foundations to, gave validity to, to the existence of black holes. So a lot of people thought they were really just uh, very, like a very nice curiosity from the, uh, uh, from the theory. But in fact, but they proved that it was just more than that, that it was a natural consequence that these things should exist. So I think it's a very nice thing that they rewarded not only the observations, but only the theory that allowed for both of them to, to, to move forward. Um, so I guess the next big breakthrough that I, that I would be very interested in, uh, I mean, it's not something particularly to black holes, but it's definitely important for particle physics and for astronomy, is the origin of dark matter. So we know that dark matter governs a lot of the evolution of the universe at large scales. So how galaxies form, how galaxies how, how galaxies group together, how they move around, even how our own galaxy rotates, uh, owes a lot of its movement to the to the this unknown uh, material that's unknown matter called that we just very simply and naively call dark matter. And there's a lot of experiments going on trying to understand it from different sides, different teams. So I think one uh, uh, one of the probably the next big advancement will be will be dark matter because if we discover dark matter to be a new particle and like evidence directly for evidence then that will also affect everything that we know about the particle and the standard model of physics uh, so that discovery in astronomy will have a 
but a very big influence on on our basic understanding of matter. So, and I love that that it's you you need to go to the biggest scales in the universe to try to solve the, one of the tiniest problems in the universe. And it's a, I think I think that would be a, uh, the thing to look forward in our lifetimes. Wonderful, wonderful uh, to know about this. And then I would again like to ask two questions together. Um, so there's there's one question: Would the size of the black hole reduce, like become smaller, in in or in what terms? And then the second question is basically about the time. What happens to the time when you get closer? closer to the black hole is there any change in it what what actually happens to the time yeah the time dilation yes. probably what is it yeah so it, this all comes back to some predictions of uh, general relativity so as you try to as you as you go into a, this very massive gravitational field time will start dilating so any observer outside would look at would but essentially as you start to getting close and close to the event horizon they will look at you as you would be freezing in time. So you would be just ex like the time would just freeze at the boundary of, uh, of the black hole. For you, the time will run naturally, but an observer outside would see you as freezing in this ring around the event, the event horizon. It's, it's very counterintuitive. Uh, I mean, if it, you survive, otherwise you just get spaghettified and then just get ripped apart. So uh, I wouldn't recommend... Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend uh, going near a black hole. Black hole. Uh, but a very good, and, uh, a very good uh, um, where they actually showed this relatively well uh, was in the movie Interstellar, where there was this planet very close to the, to the black hole, where, that, where the time on, that, on one of the planets was maybe just 40 minutes. But for the external uh, astronaut that was on a spacecraft far away, it had passed 20 years. Uh, so something very similar, but as you keep close, getting closer and closer to the event horizon of black hole, that time dilation gets, uh, gets, gets even spread it out uh, to, towards infinity. Um, and what was the first part of the question? Sorry. Um, it was about the size of the black hole. Will it reduce, like will it shrink or? Yeah, that was the question. So one of the things is that the, um, for these supermassive black holes, the massive, the more massive they are, the the event horizon gets bigger and bigger. Right, so uh, million solar mass, uh, million solar mass uh, black hole, uh, it's uh, it's a thousand times bigger than a thousand solar mass uh, black hole. So they just scale linearly. So uh, you can they they just that the event horizon just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, so basically, the the size of the black hole increases eventually and never decreases. No, I mean eventually, it eventually I guess it will halt because you you can you cannot just keep adding stuff, right? You will run out of material and stars out there. So eventually, it will it will come to a it will come to a stop because there's no more material in. But then that's where Hawking radiation would come in. Because if there's nothing coming in, then a little bit of a time, it's just like having a little bit of a, a fracture in a, in a tube in your house, right? Just a tiny little bit of water just comes out. You won't run out of water, like the river next to your house will still have a lot of water. But if you wait a long time, that all that water will eventually dry up everything. Uh, but you'll have to wait trillions and trillions of years for that to happen. Answering to that question, I have a few connected questions probably somewhere. They are connected. Uh, this question from Afid and Kushal, Kaushal in fact. Uh, a qu question from Afid is that it is predicted that Mil Milky Way and Andromeda will merge after billions of years. Um, th then what will happen to the su supermassive black hole of both galaxies at the middle? So basically, it's talking about both of them coming together. At the same time, uh, the Kaushal's question is, uh, what happens when two neutral stars collide? Will there be any formation of black holes? So if you could answer. Yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting because both of them have a very similar outcome. Uh, so the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are on a collision path. So they're, do they're the two biggest galaxies in our local group of galaxies. So they're quite massive. Um, they are coming together, and it will take around 
five billion years, rough, roughly, uh, for the both for the both galaxies to start merging. And what it happens is that because these black holes are very massive indeed, they will they will try to when these two galaxies start merging together into a one single blob of of stars, the two black holes will start sinking into the middle, and they will start attracting to each other, and they will start uh, orbiting around each other, and then we expect after emitting gravitational waves, emitting energy out of it, that these two will eventually collapse into a single mass, into a single supermassive black hole. Um, and in fact, that's something that we're going to try and do uh, with the next generation of experiments for gravitational waves, which I think is a fantastic idea. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it's so it's uh, so right now we have these interferometers on on uh, on the on the ground on, on Earth. Right. But what they're planning to do is now putting them in space. So putting spacecrafts. Uh, flying in a in a configuration, so three spacecrafts going in a triangular, orbiting around the Earth, uh, two million kilometers apart from each other, shooting lasers at each other, and measuring if a gravitational wave comes by them, they can measure these tiny little shifts, just as we do it here on Earth. Which is amazing, right? Spacecrafts, millions of kilometers, shooting lasers. Sounds like science fiction. But what they will be enable us to do is to actually look for signatures of supermassive black holes colliding, and hopeful. And and this is something that we could probably expect to see in 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 the next twenty years. So this mission is called Lisa. Uh, you can try and just search it in the web. Uh, but it will. Uh, I think it is planned to launch in the twenty thirties. And for the neutron stars, it's very similar uh, because general relativity really doesn't care. It just needs two masses orbiting around each other. So if you have two neutron stars, these things will also, once they're close enough, they will meet gravitational waves, collapse, and emit. Uh, and now the, the question is what happens afterwards? If they were massive enough, these neutron stars, they might collapse and produce a neutron star, or they might collapse... Uh, if they go above the threshold for the neutron star to so support itself, they will collapse into a black hole. So there are the two uh, there are the two possibilities. Uh, but at the mo at the moment, that we have very few neutron star neutron stars that we have observed with uh, LIGO. The most famous one was in 2016, I believe, so where essentially one quarter of astronomers all around the world were involved. Everybody used their telescopes to go and look at it because the interesting about thing about a neutron star is that if it doesn't form a black hole, really, uh, there's a lot of light that can escape. So they're actually incredibly bright. And we caught one in the act. So we observed this afterglow of the, of the exploding neutron star. And it just, all the astronomers went crazy about it. Uh, and there's a lot of information and really nice videos about it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Juan. I have one last question and then we're done. Um, the last question is, basically about what do you suggest to the young students whom we have here who are dreaming to become someone like you or like they want to they, they want to become an astronomer they want to become astrophysicists i mean i want you to give them a piece of advice on how they have to think as a student what should they do how should they be the best um probably among the team or you know how can they be successful yeah yeah uh so one of the things uh i, I would recommend I mean, is that there are multiple ways of becoming an astronomer or an astrophysicist uh i am a uh i i i was i originally studied mechanical engineer uh in my courses i was i was looking about I had courses on cars, turbines, uh, nothing to do with astronomy. But I eventually reached out because there was a lot of um, there's a uh, there's a lot of ways to do astronomy, um, and there and I think there is a place for everybody. If you like how to do instruments, there's ways to do that. If you want to just be theory, you can do that. And a lot of it is, uh, uh, I mean, I was interested in maths. I was interested in physics. Uh, I had a lot of uh, self-interest in doing a lot of this. So when I was trying to choose a project for my thesis in my undergrad, I approached the Institute of Astronomy and tried to see if there was a way that I could get involved. And that's how I get involved in, in instrumentation. 
and then eventually studying black holes. Uh, so, so don't be discouraged uh, about uh, if you haven't chose the correct, uh, like, oh, I haven't done physics, maybe I cannot do it. Uh, there are ways. Uh, there are multiple ways. Uh, thankfully, all of these, all of these um, avenues, we speak the same language, we speak the same physics, we speak the same maths. Uh, so I would suggest just get comfortable. Uh, I would, I would, one thing I would really recommend is learn how to program, learn, learn how to code. Uh, a lot of modern astronomy and astrophysics require the programming. Uh, and thankfully, the internet uh, has most, most of the questions that you would require have been answered. That's how I learned to code, just by trying to do something by myself and going and Googling it and then looking for the answer and then trying to implement. So there's a lot of ways that you can uh, even just by yourself be helping you to achieve your, your goals later, later down the line. Thank you so much, Dr. Juan. Thank you so much. And, and to the uh, all the audience over there, this is what we've been keep telling you. So this is this is to tell you, Dr. Juan, like we have a lot of students who have taken up internship at SSCID and most of them are from engineering background. But yes, they are interested in astrophysics related topic and they feel so sad that I can't do anything and I'm like, okay, you know what, there are different ways and I think what you said just now is one of the way to get into pure science related research and works and projects with, with your engineering background. Don't feel that you made a mistake, but instead think that uh, you have one of these, you know, you use all the, all the things that you've learned during engineering and apply those for, you know, physics and you could do wonders, like, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for that. Yes. Uh, again, astronomer is not, is not anymore this lone person on top of, on, of an observatory. Uh, for example, I, all my data is coming from robotic telescopes. And in order for that to happen, there had to be some very clever programmers and engineers that made everything possible that for me to just do a click on a computer, uh, I can make a telescope in Australia move to whatever I want. And that is helping drive all of the, all of the astronomy forward. So uh, there's a lot and there's, there's room for everyone. Uh, and especially down the line, there's a lot, all these new surveys and telescopes are, that are going to be built. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of the data is going to be public. There's, we have astronomers nowadays, we have more data than we can handle. So, uh, so there's a lot of things that you can you can get involved, and uh, yeah. So, I, there's plenty to do. Uh, there's more than one way to achieve your goals. So, just don't discourage and go for it. Yep, yep, absolutely. And uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of SSCRD and all our attendees and students and uh, everyone. In fact, thank you so much for giving your time and joining us and explaining uh, more about black holes and answering all our questions. Thank you so much again. And um, for all the audience over there, we will be back with another amazing space talk. So stay tuned. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. And thank you, Dr. Juan. Thank you so much.